770 BC. The Zhou's King Ping moves his capital eastward from Hajing to Luoyi, today's Luoyang, Henan province. And the Eastern Zhou Kingdom supersedes the Western Zhou. Rows of broom corn millet, foxtail millet with full heads, I drag my steps overcome by emotion. Those who know me say I'm sad at heart, those who don't, that I seek something. Distant heaven, who caused all this? Thus did Xing Yi, a distressed Eastern Zhou scholar official, sigh at the vicissitudes of history. The Western Zhou's once grand palaces were now crop fields. The Zhou kingdom had declined sharply. Its king was overlord in name only. Records of the grand historian calls that 294 years between 770 and 476 BC, from when King Ping moved the capital to when Yuan became king of Zhou, the spring and autumn period. A power struggle was brewing. It is autumn. The pioneer watching crowd has long since left Wangcheng Park in Luoyang. Where lofty palaces stood thousands of years ago, autumn leaves are now dropping. 2,600 years ago, this was the Eastern Zhou capital. Outside the city, war clouds were gathering. The Zhou king had already lost his power and authority, so no lord would obey his orders. More than 140 ducal states were at war with each other. The future head of the state of Qi, Xiaobai, was a man on the move. He would become Duke Huang, a famous overlord in his own time and in ours. However, his road to power was not easy. His older brother, Duke Xiang of Qi, was a ruthless ruler who had forced his younger brothers to flee. When he was eventually killed, the people yearned for a new, legitimate ruler. There were two suitable candidates. Xiaobai's other older brother, Zhu, was taking refuge in the state of Liu. Xiaobai himself had fled to the state of Zhu. To reach home, Xiaobai had to take this mountain road from Yijiao to Zibo. It was a fateful journey for the future of the state of Qi. The road led to the capital of Qi, a state now masterless. Would Xiaobai or Zhu return first to become the new ruler? As Xiaobai's older brother, Zhu had an advantage. To ensure that Zhu would inherit the kingdom, the state of Yu sent Guan Chong to kill Xiaobai on his way to Qi. Near Jimo, Xiaobai and his entourage were hurrying on their journey. Guan Chung, who had been lying low, suddenly shot an arrow at Xiaobai. <coughs> Groaning in pain, Xiaobai fell back in his wagon. Believing Xiaobai dead, Guan Chung sent a messenger to Liu to report the good news. But the arrow had hit Xiaobai's robe buckle. The Duke's son had cheated death. Xiaobai continued on without stopping. He arrived at Qi one step ahead of his brother. In 685 BC, Xiaobai became Duke Huang of Qi. With power now in his hands, Duke Huang sent you a letter. As Zhu is my brother, I can't bear to kill him myself. I invite you to kill him instead. However, Guan Zhong is my enemy, and I must chop him to pieces with my own hand. Hence the Chinese expression, the grudge of an arrow. Liu was forced to kill Zhu, 
and sent Guan Chong to Qi in a cage. Everyone believed that Duke Huan would eliminate Guan Chong as soon as he arrived in Qi. But Duke Huan was keen to bring order back to his state. He appointed Guan Zhong as his prime minister, thereby revoking his grudge of an arrow. The wise ruler and loyal advisor then established Qi's hegemony during the spring and autumn period. Their vaulting ambition is displayed on this hanging tablet, which reads, One Empire Under Heaven. Guangzhou initiated wholesale reform. He restructured Qi's administration, centralized government authority, encouraged agriculture and commerce, increased state revenues, improved weapons, and strengthened the military. 我觉得他的重要就体现在他是这个齐国争霸策略的一个制定者吧 while the Zhou dynasty was weak and frail, Qi was booming. Duke Huan's ambition grew as his state's power increased. He awaited the perfect opportunity to dominate all under heaven. This section of the Great Wall was built by the state of Yan at the end of the Warring States period, 500 to 220 BC, to resist the Shanrung barbarians. Rung and Di barbarians from the northwest were mostly horse riding herdsmen. The Zhou court saw them as backward tribesmen. King Ping of Zhou had moved his capital east because of their invasion. His capital was left in ruins, and many states in central China were ravaged by the horsemen. The danger posed by the Rung and Di barbarians was becoming clearer. In 663 BC, the state of Yan was losing the battle with the Shanrung barbarians. It was about to perish. Duke Huan's minister of state, Guan Zhong, told him to resist the barbarians while uniting all the states. The duke decided to adopt the strategy, fight the barbarians, cooperate with the other dukes, and honor the Zhou court. This helped pave his way to becoming the overlord. Zhou Wang Shi, he is a 转衰他的整个的诸侯Duke Huan led the army to rescue Yan, defeating the Shanrung barbarians at lightning speed. Yan both avoided the shame of subjugation and gained 250 square kilometers of territory. The head of Yan, Duke Zhuang, expressed his gratitude by escorting Duke Huan back to Qi. According to the rights of the Zhou court, a duke could not farewell another on the latter's territory. This privilege was reserved for the king. So Duke Huan graciously announced, no duke deserves to be sent over a border to say farewell. Yet it would be rude of me to reject Yan's good wishes. He then decided to cede to Yan the land within Qi on which Duke Zhuang had stepped. He also urged Duke Zhuang to observe the Zhou rights and support the Zhou court. All the dukes were moved by his generous actions and praised him as a man of great virtue.
Duke Huan gained great prestige in a series of affairs between the states, but he knew that he must take on further challenging responsibilities. By the time the Rung and Di had been contained, a more powerful force was looming, the state of Chu. While Qi was rising, Chu had conquered the states of Xi and Deng. Paralleling the northern barbarians, Chu held the balance of power in the south. Facing Chu's aggression, all the ducal states sought help from Qi. The victorious Duke Huan now decided to engage with Chu's troops. In 656 BC, Duke Huan led the troops of Liu, Sun, Chen, and Wei to camp on Mount Xingshan, blocking the northern entrance to Chu. Seeing a huge army pressing on the border, Chu felt threatened and sent an envoy to negotiate. The envoy said to Duke Huan, you are in the north, we are in the south. We are totally unrelated like the horse and the ox. Why do you bring your troops here to attack Chu? Guan Zhong replied that Qi held Chu responsible for failing to supply the court with the reed filters for the ceremonial wine. He accused Chu of failing to observe the Zhou rites and the primogeniture rules. He said he was authorized by Duke Huan to punish Chu on behalf of the Zhou king. The Zhou used the rites, which defined social rankings and relevant ritual etiquette, to govern the court and the ducal states, the nobility and the commoners. Ning 我们说你要交纳一定的服饰，当然这个金库的方式是多种多样的啊。但是无论是楚国也好，还是其他小国也好，你都要承担这些义务。With both a strong army and the moral advantage of being loyal to the court, Duke Wan won without a battle. Chu apologized and promised to provide the ceremonial reeds as tribute. The Shaolin Treaty then effectively stopped Chu expanding into central China. Duke Huan also turned his attention to the court. King Hui of Zhou favored Prince Dai over the Crown Prince. But Duke Huan summoned all the dukes to support the Crown Prince's accession as King Xi'an. Gaining respect from all parties, the Duke was acknowledged as the overlord. The Quichou Temple sits beside an ancient road near the Yellow River in Mingquan County, Yunnan Province. In 651 BC, the states of Qi, Liu, Song, Wei, Zheng, Shu, and Cao held a meeting here. It was the first time during the spring and autumn period that more than four states had thus sat together. King Xiang sent Duke Huan as his envoy thereby acknowledging him as the overlord. Duke Huan was the first of many overlords during the spring and autumn period. The Quichou Temple Treaty contained a pledge to defend the primogenitor system of inheritance in order to maintain clan structure. It reconfirmed the Western Zhou's political conception of morality and virtue and promoted mutual respect among states. Quichou's Huimeng, it is a symbol. It is a symbol of 
，啊，齐桓公这个整个的霸业，他达到了一个高峰啊。那么这个高峰呢，就是说他有成果的啊，就是制定了一些游戏规则。那么这个游戏规则呢，主要就是要解决对内啊，我们要消除内乱啊，同时呢要维护啊周天子。啊，就是周王室给我们啊保留下的这些正常的秩序啊，所以说啊，求坤这个会盟制定的这些规则，对于啊某一个时期，就是对这个时期啊短暂的去稳定当时的啊社会的秩序，它是发挥了重大的作用。Duke Huan allied with other states three times and organized meetings between them six times. He supported the clan system's principle of primogeniture, and unambitious for himself, he knew that he had to observe the rites in the name of the king. King Xiang sent his grand steward Ji Kung to the Quichou Temple meeting to present ritual meat for the Zhou ancestors to Duke Huan. The king permitted the aged duke to accept the gift without kneeling. But Duke Huan insisted that the king's majesty was not to be violated. He said he must observe the rites and submit himself as a loyal subject, otherwise he would face the consequences. Then he walked down on his knees to receive the grand steward before accepting the gift. Though submissive to the Zhou court, Duke Huan was already unquestionably the leading power. Abundantly wealthy, he had defeated dozens of minor states with his strong army. Continuously enlarging, the state of Qi was the strongest and most wealthy of the eastern vassal states. The site of Duke Huan's hall in Zibo, Shandong province. The duke is said to have entertained his ministers and the other dukes and to have ceremonially honored army generals in this place. Thousands of years have now passed. The land of Duke Wan has been turned into productive crop fields. The epoch-making overlord had an unhappy end. After Guangzhou died, Duke Wan favored certain treacherous officials who manipulated him when he became ill. His sons fought each other for the dukedom, causing instability and the decline of his kingdom. Nevertheless, Duke Wan remains a worthy figure who had an abiding influence on Chinese history. The hegemony of successive overlords continued throughout the spring and autumn period. During the spring and autumn period, many dukes from different states became the overlord, five of whom were most famous. Though exactly which five remains unsettled. Some say Duke Wan of Qi, Duke Xiang of Song, Duke Wan of Jin, Duke Mu of Qin, and King Xuan of Chu. Others say Duke Wan, Duke Wen, King Xuan, but with King Fu Chai of Wu and King Zhou Jian of Yue. This is the famous spear used by King Fu Chai. This sharp sword belonged to King Gojiang. Late in the spring and autumn period, their two states, Wu and Yue, located south of the Yangtze River, aimed to expand northward and rule over central China. However, neither King Fu Chai nor King Gojiang was able to organize ducal allies as Duke Wan had done, and so could not summon unanimous support. Instead, the battle for hegemony was mainly between Jin and Chu.
This wall painting in the Shenxi Museum depicts the Battle of Chengpu, fought in 632 BC, at which Jin defeated the army of Chu and became the hegemonic state. Interestingly, there is another such painting in the Hubei Museum, which strikingly resembles it in many respects. However, the scene in this painting is the Battle of B of 597 BC, where Jin was defeated by Chu. These two famous battles, later recounted in the commentary of Zhuo from the 4th century BC, seem just as vivid to us today. Amid these power struggles, Duke Wen of Jin was the first from his state to step onto history's stage. Duke Wen of Jin, recovering his state by Li Tang a mid 12th century Song Dynasty masterpiece, now in New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. This scroll painting in six sections depicts the stories of Duke Wen, who, when still named Chong'e, had been exiled by his father. Cast adrift for 19 years, he was accompanied by Hu Yang, Zhao Tsui, Zhe Zetui, and other loyal followers. When he arrived in the state of Sung, Duke Xiang gave him 20 horses. In the state of Zheng, he was ignored. The Duke of Qi, however, wed him to his daughter. Life was so good there that he didn't want to return home. But his wife and followers made him drunk and smuggled him out of Qi. And though the minister of Chu, Zi Yu, wanted to kill him, King Chang welcomed him with open arms. Stories about Duke Wen are widespread, especially in present-day Shenxi province. In northern China, the rainy season begins between May and June. Han Shi, the cold food festival, is coming, and the people of Zhezhou are preparing for it. The older villagers knead the dough and sculpt it into swallows. They call them Zetui swallows or Qingming swallows. The locals pronounce the word that means swallow like the word that means remembrance. In exile, the future Duke Wen lived a cold and hungry life. It is said that Zetui once cut a piece of flesh from his own leg to make soup for him. People from Shenxi say that because of such loyal followers, the Duke eventually rose to become the overlord. People snip and cut the dough swallows with sharp scissors. The pretty cut pattern suggests plumage and symbolically recalls the exile's ordeal. The Chinese fervently believe that you must remember past hardships and not forget the time when you were once in danger. Duke Wen set the cold food festival on the date of Zetui's death. On this day, no fire is allowed for cooking. Only cold food, such as Zetui swallow buns, can be eaten. The steams, the twee swallow buns, are dotted in red dye to symbolize peace and harmony. People skewer the cold buns on willow tree sticks and hang them on door frames. These memorialize the exiled Jin officials' integrity and also wish family members safety and happiness. But there is a tragic aspect to Duke Wen's story. On his accession, he did indeed forget to honor the Tui who retired to the forest of Jin. His burnt body was found beneath a willow tree. The Duke had ordered the forest set alight to flush out the missing man who'd failed to answer a request to attend the court. Duke Wen of Jin and Duke Wan of Qi each overcame the hardship of exile, supported by loyal followers. Chong'e was 62 when he returned to Jin with the help of the Duke of Jin. 
Immediately, he took action to reform the government and develop the economy. Duke Wen also adopted the policy of honor the king and drive off the barbarians. And Jin became the new hegemonic state. Now 靠拳头说话的这样一个时代了。In 635 BC, internal strife broke out in the Zhou court. Prince Dai conspired with the barbarians to attack the Zhou. The new and ambitious Duke Wen of Jin followed the advice of his minister Hu Yan, seeking support from the king is better than seeking help from the dukes. He escorted King Xian back to the Zhou capital and helped him to kill his nemesis, Prince Dai. His loyalty won Duke Wen prestige, and some of the minor states started to follow him. In this group of sculptures in Hama City, Shenxi Province, Duke Wen points heroically to the sky. While supporting the king, the Duke also resolutely fought the barbarians. At the time, the southern state of Chu was the greatest threat to central China. In 633 BC, his powerful army attacked the state of Sung, which turned to Duke Wen for help. The Duke quickly assembled his mighty army and took on the Chu army in the famous Battle of Chengpu in 632 BC. Five years previously, while in exile, Chong Er had promised King Chang of Chu that he would keep his army three days' march away should their two states ever declare war on each other. At Chengpu, he would keep his word, after a fashion. The Battle of Chengpu is probably the most studied encounter in Chinese military history. Duke Wen's exemplary military tactics lured the enemy into a trap. After the battle, Duke Wen summoned eight states to sign the Jantu Treaty. They swore to unite under the Zhou King and never again to attack each other. King Xi'an then appointed Duke Wen as chief duke of all the states, the new overlord. Duke Wen had achieved his position relatively peacefully. Duke Wen claimed supremacy after winning a battle. Fighting for supremacy overrode serving the king during the late spring and autumn period. The Zhou rights would be abandoned in the chaotic wars that were to come. This set of ritual vessels was collected by a Shenxi museum. Ji Kunjung specializes in the history of the state of Jin. 这一套鼎呢，它呢是就是我们常说的列鼎。那么这个这是五鼎，说明在当时呢，晋国的爵位，晋国的国国君所使用的级别应该呢，只能使用五鼎。When a duke of Jin was buried, five bronze vessels were used. A few hundred years later, this ritual rule was simply ignored. These seven bronze vessels in the same exhibition hall were used in the burial of a mere minister of the state of Jin.
，就是说，如果你从时间的纵向来看，西周是整体，春秋是整体建立了西周。While arrogating ritual entitlements to themselves, the overlords began to set their own rules. They followed the Joe rites, but not the rules governing their own relationship with the court. Instead, under the hegemony of Jin, rights and obligations between the states were more tightly regulated, systematized, and ritualized. It is recorded that Jin organized 38 meetings between the states over a hundred-year period. According to the Spring and Autumn Annals, the Duke of Liu met the Zhou King in his capital, Luoyang, only once, but met the Duke of Jin 21 times. Jin laid down rules concerning official reports and paying tributes. It forced other states' allies to punish any state that disobeyed. Jin would play the role of mediator in any dispute between states. Jin's power would eventually eclipse that of the Zhou King. Spring and autumn power struggles redrew the map. In the east, Qi wiped out more than 30 states. Chu annihilated some 40 states in the south. Jin became the leading central power after defeating 20 states and conquering 40 more. Qin merged more than ten states in the west. Based on the Zhou rites, the Central Plains culture now spread even further, shaping the very concept of China on the ground. We say it is more traditional. It is more traditional. It is more traditional. It is more traditional. 那么这种理念对于啊，就是说不同的部族来说，大家有了同一的中心，最后就啊，真正才变成了一家人啊。所以说，这对我们民族的形成，华夏民族的形成，它发挥了啊重重大的这个思想导向的作用。This expansion of powerful ducal states and the Central Plains culture they brought with them also affected the barbarians. The great southern state of Chu was regarded as semi-barbarian by the Central Plains states. This is copper grass. Where there is copper grass, there is copper. People had noticed this as early as the spring and autumn period. Tong Yu Mountain in Daya County, Hubei Province. It is covered with lush copper grass in September. Two months later. It turns purple. More than two thousand years ago, Daya was the biggest copper mine in the state of Chu. An ancient copper pit mine can still be seen on Mount Tonglu. Tonglu Shan Ancient Metallurgy Museum preserves this important site. Is Mong Qian, Shi Gai, China, and the world, the size. 最大能够见到的一片古采矿遗址，在古代，如果有了铜，它就有了石力。我们看到的这个石块的兵器，全部是用铜做的。Copper mines and advanced metallurgy were as strategically important then as oil wells and refining are today. Whoever controlled them wielded power. 说他是满意，他不满。从春秋到战国，它的这个冶炼铸钞、青铜铸钞水平已经达到了顶峰。在这个西川，西川发现的这个春秋晚期的青铜器里面，它就能够用石打发。These exquisite Chu bronzes, made using the sophisticated lost wax method, are on display in the Hubei Museum. Chu's impressive bronze-making ability showed its overall strength as a kingdom, and its importance within the Central Plains culture. We are now talking about the origin of Chinese culture. So, the early ones are said to be the origin of the Yuan, that is, the Huanghe culture, the Zhongyuan culture. This is the only one. Now, we are talking about the Yuan Ouhe. 那么实际上发现文化的主体部分
应该是长江流域或黄河流域共同构成。比如说我们这个理气的组合关系，我们都说是顶轨，是吧？它所反映的理智是一致的。我们说理气嘛，就是理智的一种物化，一种物化形态，它还是。按照这种细作周周周期的这种理智啊，那么它还是一直在实施，还是在这个贯彻落实。By King Zhuan of Chu's reign, Chu culture had already become part of Chinese culture. However, the hegemonic politics of Chinese culture spurred the young king's ambition. His state faced both internal and external troubles. To evaluate the situation around him and appease the other states, he put national affairs aside without issuing any government orders. He prohibited anyone from offering him advice. After three years of poor government, an angry minister from Qi approached him and posed a riddle. There is a type of bird in the south. It landed on a hill, rested its wings, and shut its throat for three years. What is it called? King Zhuan knew that his people wanted a strong, wealthy country. In answering the riddle, he coined a famous expression. Three years of rest will send the bird high in the sky. Three years of silence will make a sound that awakens the world. Though he had given himself over to pleasure, King Zhuan intended to rekindle his authority and would reform the government. The Chu king now cast his eye on central China. Unlike Dukes Wan and Wen, who had been loyal overlords, he wanted to destroy the Zhou court. He Nine years later, Chu fought the Battle of Bi against Jin. The Jin army was defeated, and its position as overlord was fatally compromised. In 589 BC, Chu formed an alliance with Liu, Qin, Song, Chen, Wei, Zheng, Qi, and Cao in Sichuan. This event confirmed Chu's position among the hegemonic states. Chu now received tribute from other states in central China. Qing Zhuang renounced his negligent ways, and Chu, once despised as barbarian, had now joined Chinese civilization. But Jin refused to accept its fate. Following years of preparation, it declared war on Chu in 575 BC. The battle fought at Yanling, now in Henan province, was highly significant for both states. The Battle of Yanling brought the victorious Jin back into power, though Chu remained both strong and hostile. Thirty years later, in 546 BC, the Song state minister, Shang Shu, invited 14 ducal states, including Jin, Chu, Wei, and Cao, to meet at Sui Yang, now in Henan province. At the rally for peace, they agreed to cease hostilities and acknowledge Jin and Chu as equal overlords. This Zhou King's tomb was excavated in 2002, the year of the horse. The discovery of this carriage confirmed ancient accounts that the Zhou King's carriage was drawn by six horses. 
Their colors may have faded to that of the soil, but still show that the kings of Zhou did retain some of their former authority and dignity. But superficial ritual performance aside, as the authority of the Zhou kings weakened, the Zhou rites were gradually abandoned. Overlords, who had in fact supplanted the Zhou king, guarded their supremacy with all the power they had gained. They treated their allies as mere subordinates. Ultimately, the Western Zhou's hegemonic politics subverted its own clan system. As power struggles and state mergers intensified, wars between the ducal states became more brutal. The Eastern Zhou dynasty saw the dawn of a new era, the Warring States period. But in the face of such turmoil, Chinese culture grew more cohesive and consolidated. The Chinese people yearned for peace and unity and China would enter an era when the fragmented states would be healed and united.